Well, good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Bob Schaefer. I'm a public education consultant with the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability, which is a national network of organizations from communities in the shadows of U.S. nuclear weapons research, production, testing, and waste dumping sites around the country, whose 25th anniversary this event is the first public part of. I'd um, like to welcome you all to our evening presentation. Uh, and before we get started to tell you a little bit more about the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability, I want to introduce ANA's director, Susan Gordon. Hello, welcome. This is, um, this weekend is ANA's 25th anniversary. So we're really excited to be here where we were founded in the Pacific Northwest, um, to be here with new friends and old friends. And um, I just wanted to, so just so you know who we are, uh, we're a national network of local, regional, and national organizations that have worked collaboratively on nuclear weapons production and waste cleanup issues. And um, as I said, we've been doing it for 25 years now, which is pretty remarkable. And um, let's get going. Thank you. Um, first speaker, and I'll introduce all five of them, and then they can come up sequentially. Uh, the first speaker is Leonard Iger. Leonard is with Puget Sound Nuclear Free Zone, um, and he is going to talk about, uh, his topic is, Nuclear Disarmament Begins at Home. Uh, second is Russell Jim. Stand up, Russell, so I can see you. Uh, Russell is with the Yakima Indian Nation, and he's going to deliver a tribal perspective on Hanford. Third in the middle is, uh, of the middle of the guys, is... <laughs> Tom Carpenter, uh, Tom is a lawyer with Hanford Challenge, and he's going to be talking about whistleblowers and the waste treatment plant. Uh, fourth is Chuck Johnson. Chuck is uh, recently, Chuck's been involved with lots of things in the region. I saw him greeting people he hadn't seen in a number of years. Uh, Chuck is now with Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, and he's going to be talking about nuclear power, specifically the Columbia generating station and small modular reactors. And last but not least, batting cleanup because she put this together, uh, is Liz Madison, also from Hanford Challenge. And her topic is provocatively inheriting Hanford, getting young people involved. Uh, and with that, if there are no questions about the logistics or the program, let's get into the substance that you're here for. Just quick background how I got into this. I'm a, an industrial hygienist by profession and uh, you know, working in the public health arena, trying to prevent occupational illness and disease. That's my passion. That's what I spend my life trying to do. And so as I moved along in my career, things started to creep in about nuclear weapons because in graduate school, we learned about the effects of radiation. And it all came from our knowledge that's come from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So cut from there to here, it's a long story, but I am passionate about this work, to disarm, to abolish nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. So I want to begin, because I know there are a few of you here tonight that may not know this. So the question tonight is, to begin, where, outside of Russia, and possibly even including Russia, is the location of the largest concentration of um, pardon me, operational nuclear weapons? There they are, and I want to thank Dr. David Hall, who created much of what's in here. I created a PowerPoint from some of his slides and threw a few of my things in, but I love this, so his base closed. This is the goal. This is the goal, to take a base where there are 35,000 people working to maintain and deploy nuclear weapons, the, the most you know, powerful destructive force the world knows, Trident, and take those 35,000 people and find alternative employment, sustainable jobs for life, and not preparing for the ultimate omnicide, the use of nuclear weapons. So this is the main gate at the Bangor base, and where the, where the weapons of mass destruction are. And um, I am, and I'll briefly talk about it in a bit, Puget Sound Nuclear Weapon Free Zone campaign is something that I started with some other individuals, but I am really an integral part of Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action, and we have others here from, that are part of Ground Zero Center. 
And for 35 years, Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action has witnessed and resisted nuclear weapons, in particular the Trident nuclear weapons system. And this is actually one of our vigils and nonviolent direct actions. Uh, it was Martin Luther King weekend um, in 2011, I believe, um, where we actually were fortunate enough to close the gate for 30 minutes, roughly almost 30 minutes, which was quite a feat. Um, but it's not just about you know, symbolically closing the base. Um, and this is Ground Zero Center's kind of mission statement. But it's really about going to the roots of nonviolence, because nuclear weapons are really the taproot of violence in our world. There's nothing that is the manifestation of violence like nuclear weapons. They are the ultimate, just horrific thing out there. And so Ground Zero is about, its core is nonviolence. And witnessing and resisting Trident is, is really at the heart of what Ground Zero has done for 35 years. And David Hall said this really well. I used his slide and just added something that he also says in there that, you know, our public health issues are moral issues and nuclear weapons are ultimately a public health issue. There is nothing that is more potentially destructive to the public health than nuclear weapons. And there really is no cure. Once we use nuclear weapons, once there's even a limited nuclear conflict, all bets are off. There is no cure. The only thing we can do is abolish the weapons. So again, that's always at the heart of what we do. And just lastly on that, I think this picture of one of our um, actions out there uh, says it all. Billions for life, not billions for death. That's what this is about. It's, it is an economic issue, very much, just like Hanford. Everything we will talk about tonight are economic issues, and they're deep economic issues when you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars that are being wasted when human needs are going unmet. But also the moral issue of nuclear weapons and what they can and will do if they are ever used. So getting back to Trident, um, they really are the centerpiece of U.S. military policy. They are the crown jewel, I think that's the, the term that Dave Hall uses, of the nuclear triad of the bombers and gravity bombs, the ICBMs in their underground silos, and then the submarines. That's the triad of nuclear weapons systems in this country. And one of the reasons is this, that they're the most survivable and enduring nuclear strike capability in this country. Submarines can cruise underwater, hidden away, anywhere in the world, and then they can strike anywhere in the world because they have a range of over 4,000 miles, every one of those Trident missiles. So, you know, from a military standpoint, uh, the government loves them. They are, Admiral Rickover, the you know, father of the nuclear program, would, would just be dancing in his grave at, at what the Navy has been able to do. <clears throat> now, the newest missile, the newest Trident missile, the D-5s, and this is a, a quote here, supposedly can hit a target as small as home plate. They're, they have extraordinary accuracy, which is pretty ridiculous to even think of, a weapon that has such a range of, of destruction. And that's the next thing to look at. We're 20 miles from the Bangor base. Now, I wouldn't be worrying about a nuclear weapon going off there, although I might worry about uh, having an incident where they would release some radiation because I can't remember the year. Was it 2004, Glenn? I think when the latter incident? 2003. Pardon me? 2003, sorry. Uh, where they were actually unloading missiles from a Trident sub. They put a ladder down, which is standard procedure. They climb down, they put the hooks on, and then they hoist the missile out so they can service it. Well, they took a lunch break, and this is God's, God's truth. They uh, left the ladder in, took their lunch break, went back out, somebody hit the button, started the hoist, and all of a sudden someone said, yeah, thing's about to puncture the nose cone. And it came within inches of one of the warheads. So that incident could have released a great deal of radiation in the, in the area. There wouldn't have been a nuclear explosion, but what I wanted to show is what Dave Hall uses this to show is if there was a nuclear bomb uh, dropped over the city of Seattle, what would happen with a, a modern nuclear weapon? Well, 
the largest nuclear warhead on the um, Tridents is 475 kilotons. And in comparison, the Hiroshima weapon uh, was 15 kilotons, I believe. So the immediate you know, 2.1 kilometers would be just incinerated from the initial fireball that spreads out. And this is all happening in, in milliseconds and in seconds. And then it would continue to go out. And the intense burst of radiation going out another 2. Point to 2.7 kilometers would just gamma and neutron radiation would just kill people out there, including the blast. And then all the way out uh, from there, another 5.6, and then another, I think it's a total of eight some odd kilometers out, people would be, I mean, structures are destroyed, people are, are burned critically. And Dave Hall always reminds us that they're, all the burn beds in the area are right down here in Seattle, and they'd be gone. Well. Recently, I was reading that there aren't enough burn beds in the entire world, if you looked at the total burn beds available in hospitals, everywhere in the world to treat the number of victims that would survive with third degree burns just from one nuclear detonation. So it's just to give you a perspective of a modern nuclear weapon and the range of immediate destruction, not to include all the radiation that goes out into fallout and all the associated effects. It's just horrific. And once it's done, once um, a bomb is dropped, there's no way to clean up. You know, it's tough enough cleaning up at Hanford. But all bets are off with this. So I'm going to move on pretty quickly. Each sub at Banger, 24 missiles, each missile aid warheads, you can do the math from there. And as it's been stated, a single Trident submarine is the sixth largest nuclear nation in the world all by itself. And I'm going to jump ahead here. Whoop, actually, I don't have to. What's happening here locally? You know you'll learn about things going on in other parts of the country. But right here, the missiles have been undergoing a life extension program, the warheads, for a number of years. So the W-76, the smaller warhead, They've been refurbished. And so it's basically like getting a new laptop. You buy it, you get a warranty. It's basically new and improved. The warheads now are, are better than they were initially. And there's also a project where the Navy wants to build a second explosives handling wharf at Bangor. And there are pamphlets over here that we have about that project. Um, Glenn Milner has spearheaded a lawsuit against the Navy to stop the construction of the second explosives handling wharf. It's unnecessary. And it's destabilizing. It just shows that we are trying to build up our nuclear weapons infrastructure. And what are other countries taking from that? What is the message that's sending? This is the existing wharf, and they want to have a second one. They claim they need more hours to build it. But what I wanted to really focus on, not to undermine that, but the new planned submarine. The Tridents are getting old. We need new submarines. They want to build 12 new ballistic missile submarines it will cost $100 billion to con just for construction, and they would sail. The last one would sail to the year 2082 or beyond. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if we'll be around that long if we keep nuclear submarines with their missiles sailing the seven seas. So tonight, my question, and I'm not sure if, as I wrap up, my question is, what can we as citizens and as ANA members and groups do to help the U.S. become a leader in abolishing nuclear weapons rather than the leader in a destabilizing proliferation regime, which is what we're doing. So I'm going to quit there. And I'll, I will say that there are, the title of my talk tonight was Nuclear Disarmament Begins at Home. We have free bumper stickers out here. You're welcome to take one. And, uh, Thank you. Good evening. My name is Russell Jim. I'm a member of the Yakima Nation. I have been doing studies and uh, a lot about Hanford for 35 years. Ever since 1977, when I found out they had already studied Hanford for a year, consider it to be the nuclear waste repository for the world. And they had at one time, in a meeting not long after, determined that 
the site could be the nuclear weapons repository for all the weapons in the nuclear waste in the world. And they would set the site aside for 250,000 years. Then they start to figure out among the CEOs that were there, the attorneys, the uh, a whole host of uh, leadership. They try to figure out how, what type of a marker are we going to leave. They discussed all types of markers. Couldn't figure out which one would be best to leave. To warn people of what would be, what would be there. And finally, I spoke up. I said, we'll tell them. And they got confused. They asked what I meant. I said, we've been here since the beginning of time. We plan to be here till the end of time. We'll tell them. The Yakima Nation has ceded rights from the coast here to Canada, to western Montana, northern Arizona, Northern California. That is the usual and custom places of the Yakima Nation wandered and, and roamed, inhabited. Some of the names along the coast here are Yakima names. Snoqualmie, Issaquah, you call it Issaquah, it's Issaquah. Um, many of those have their own meanings. But just be assured <clears throat> that on the land that the Hanford site sits now is ceded land. That which we said, okay, you can use the land, but we retain the rights to those, to that land, to gather our foods and medicines and to live in usual custom ways that we were used to. The Hanford site was the wintering ground for the Yakima Nation for millennia. As it is witnessed by the three rivers, the confluence there, it is low in elevation, so the winters were milder. That's why we moved there. And then they decided that this place, at Hanford, was a wasteland. They said they, they were going to, they decided to put the Manhattan Project there because of, it was an isolated wasteland. It had the proper amount of water to cool their reactors they knew they needed, had the cheap electricity from Bonneville Dam and eventually from Grand Coulee, and the people were expendable. That was written. I have from, uh, a written statement here I'd like to read to you. Good evening, my name is Russell Jim and I'm the manager of the Yakima Nation's Environmental Restoration Waste Management Program. I appreciate the opportunity to address those of you who are acquainted with the challenges of nuclear production and progress in advancing our concerns. Significant issues remain to be resolved, but as we know too well, politics often intervene, especially as the public becomes more aware of these issues. This greater awareness by citizens requires greater work on our part to increase understanding with political leaders. These challenges have been highlighted by proliferation of nuclear weapons, breaches of security by activists, and of course, the Fukushima incident. The nuclear waste problem is not yet entirely solved. Nuclear energy is not yet too cheap to meter. The public still has misgivings. This is the America, American nuclear society, isn't it? On a more practical note, it is good to see that the nuclear industry and weapons complex is finally coming to terms with these challenges. With enhanced communication and stakeholder outreach, 
Serious problems may be set aside for another day or for another generation. The Yakima Nation faces this situation as it always has, exemplified by our leaders who signed the Treaty of 1855 with the United States. Despite threats and under great duress, the signers of the treaty refused to compromise the indigenous rights of our people to the natural resources which continue to support the Yakima culture today. It is still not fully understand that it was the Yakima Nation which made a grant of land and rights to the United States in the treaty, not the reverse. Though concerted efforts have been made to undermine its legal standing through manipulations or the logic of the uninformed, the treaty remains as the supreme law of the land in the U.S. constitutional system. The treaty guarantees rights perpetually to fish in all usual and accustomed places and to hunt and gather foods and medicines on all open and unclaimed land. These words have great meaning to the Yakima. Over the past century and a half, the Yakima have upheld our half of the treaty. We have often had to uphold the United States' half as well. The Hanford site is located on land ceded to the United States in the treaty. Yakima treaty rights at Hanford are undiminished since the treaty was signed in 1855, and this means that cleanup and restoration at Hanford must protect those tribal uses. The U.S. Department of Energy has responded to this situation not by working to protect our people from the threats of nuclear waste, but by claiming that Hanford is not open and unclaimed land. This line of reasoning requires us to imagine that DOE will use institutional controls to restrict the use of Hanford resources for thousands of years into the future. This sort of thought process leads us to believe that intelligent life does indeed exist in outer space. Otherwise, they would have contacted us by now. <laughs> in 2002, the Yakima Nation sued DOE over its plans to leave nuclear waste in place, thus harming natural resources protected in the treaty. The Yakima's Natural Resource Damage lawsuit was joined by Washington, Oregon, and the Umatilla and Nespers tribes. Work resulted from this action recently producing, produced a startling finding. Let me read that again. Work resulting from this action recently produced a startling finding. The preliminary estimate of Hanford damages at more than $20 billion demonstrate how much nuclear waste DOE plans to leave in the Pacific Northwest. Another recent revelation embedded in DOE's life cycle scope, schedule, and cost report is even more sobering. About a, after about a quarter century of work, the federal government has still not come to grips with the magnitude of work involved in cleaning up Hanford. Hanford's true environmental cleanup costs are still unknown. The most recent DOE estimate, 115 billion more, leaves out costs for removing some of the worst hazards, including buried transuranic waste, removing the canyon facilities and waste, and the time bomb in the deep Vados zone. Congress is being kept in the dark about these liabilities, which will likely add tens of billions to eventual costs and which will get worse as time goes on. When Jim Warner was at DOE, he led enough effort to estimate how much it would cost to clean up the atomic weapons legacy nationwide. 
At about 300 billion, taxpayers were being asked to spend another 5% on top of the cost of building the nuclear weapons arsenal to restore the damaged environment. I still have two and a half pages to go. If you want me to stop now, I, I think we can talk about that in the questions and answers if you can address those issues then. There we go. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Tom Carpenter, and I'm the executive director of Hanford Challenge. And we're a five-year-old organization. Um, before Hanford Challenge, I worked for Government Accountability Project, uh, representing whistleblowers uh, as their nuclear program coordinator, uh, nuclear oversight campaign coordinator. Uh, and before that, I ran a uh, uh, grassroots organization in Cincinnati, Ohio, opposed to the Zimmer nuclear plant. I also got involved uh, in overseeing a nuclear weapons site there called Fernald. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of start there because Fernald uh, was a secret facility in Cincinnati. And even as uh, you know, a pretty knowledgeable uh, nuclear activist there in Cincinnati, the existence of the Fernald site came as a surprise to me. And uh, I had to go look for it and find it and really kind of drove around it a few times before I realized this, this was it because the sign on it said Feed Materials Production Center. And it had a Ralston Purina tower there, a checkered tower, and there were cows grazing on it. It didn't look anything like a nuclear facility. But then it was confirmed to me what it was uh, when I started taking samples from the creek there and guards showed up with machine guns, you know, questioning what the heck I was doing. So I, I knew I had the right place then. Um, and I, I started working with workers at, at Fernald and uh, at, at the Zimmer nuclear site uh, and found that the best source of information about what was really happening out there were those people. And to write them off and dismiss them uh, just because they work there was, was a big mistake. Um, and in fact, uh, many of them felt very, very closely to how I felt uh, about the whole situation. They were working there uh, you know, as a job. Well, uh, eventually I got introduced to the, the Hanford nuclear site uh, in 1987 or 8. I kind of forget which one it was at this point. Um, I got a call from a whistleblower named Casey Rood. And uh, I, at that time I was working in Washington, D.C as a young lawyer for the Government Accountability Project. And the more I learned about Hanford, and the more I learn about Hanford, uh, low these many years later, it's, uh, it's just mind boggling. Hanford is the United States and actually the Western Hemisphere's largest, most, co most contaminated nuclear facility. Uh, it's 585 square miles. It's got 80 square miles or so of contaminated groundwater beneath the site. Uh, it's dumped uh, many hundreds of billions of contaminated liquid into the ground and into the river there. So the cleanup job from 45 years of making plutonium from the nuclear uh, weapons mach war machine uh, is just, it's just massive. Uh, and it's going to dwarf the, the production cost of these weapons uh, in the end if, we're, if we really decide that we're going to clean this up uh, to a protective standard. It will take many hundreds of billions of dollars, and it will take, I'm sure, hundreds of years to get it to a point where it'll be safe. Um, I'm, I'm here to, tonight, though, to talk about uh, the waste treatment plant. And at Hanford, the worst of the worst stuff is the high-level nuclear waste stored in 177 underground nuclear waste tanks. Many of you have heard about these tanks. Uh, they're old, uh, they're underground, and they're full of uh, highly toxic, highly poisonous radiation, radioactive materials mixed with chemicals. And a third of these tanks have already leaked, uh, have failed and leaked. Uh, Hanford says a million gallons. We say it's more like six million to 10 million gallons of, of nuclear waste into the soil beneath the tanks. Uh, much of that waste, or some of that waste at least, has hit the groundwater and is heading toward or is in the river. Um, so that's one of our most urgent priorities is right now recovering the waste that's in the tanks and in the soil uh, so that future generations are protected from this stuff. Because as we all know, 
the material lasts for a very long time. Uh, it's dangerous uh, biologically, uh, and it's also um, uh, you know, dangerous in very, very tiny amounts and cannot be destroyed. It has to decay away at its own rate. So Hanford's answer to the nuclear waste issue in the tanks is to remove the waste from the tanks and move it to a facility called the waste treatment plant. And this is also known as the vitrification facility, and everyone calls it the VIT plant. So it's got several names, but it's got the same function of it is supposed to mix the high-level nuclear waste with molten glass. That molten glass is poured into a canister or many canisters, and those canisters are allowed to cool, the, the glass solidifies, and then that waste, by law, is supposed to go to a deep geological underground repository somewhere someday, um, away from um, you know, life uh, so that it doesn't affect uh, future generations. Um, and in fact, now we're on our fourth iteration to try to build this glass plant, this VIT plant. And this time, we're 12 years into the last project, the most recent project, the waste treatment plant. Um, it's 65% com completed. Uh, it's 90% designed. But we now know from whistleblowers inside that the plant may not open. It certainly won't function as designed. Um, and people are paying a very high price for bringing this news forward to us. And it's our job as, as Hanford Challenge to uh, work with these people, give them a defense, uh, but more importantly, help them become uh, heard by the public, by Congress, by the news media. Uh, and, and we do that through the courts. We do that through uh, you know, congressional hearings and, and through, uh, of course, taking these folks to the news media. So Rachel Maddow featured one of these whistleblowers uh, last December uh, when she interviewed him, Walt Tamasitis, who received an award from Alliance for Nuclear Account Accountability last year. Um, they've been uh, uh, featured in USA Today, um, in the Washington Post, the New York Times, regionally over and over again on national public radio, et cetera. Well, what is the effect of that? The effect is that today, the Department of Energy has suspended construction and design of the waste treatment plant. I'm not saying that's good news, um, I, but it had to happen because the plant now is in a situation where if they were to complete it as designed and as constructed, it would be a health and safety menace uh, to the region and to the country. Uh, it turns out that they uh, designed a plant that would not sufficiently mix the high-level waste uh, hydrogen gas would, would build up, could ignite or explode, uh, and plutonium could separate out and cause a nuclear criticality on the bottom of the tanks. They, weren't, they didn't design the plant to withstand that kind of accident, uh, either hydrogen explosion or a fire or nuclear criticality. They had dismissed it as, oh, not credible. So if you, need, if you have a problem with not mixing this stuff well, then what do you do? Well, you increase the flow of the mixers, but if you do that, now you're eroding holes into the, the vessels and the piping, and now there's not pictures floating around showing these gaping holes in the pipes and in the vessels from several days of testing. Now, the, this, uh, this plant is supposed to operate for 40 years without maintenance, inspection, or repair capability. So all of this is supposed to uh, the engineers all kind of roll their eyes and say, oh, what? Yes, they designed this with the black cell concept, meaning they have this big room with no doors or windows, and it's dark, and it, everything's supposed to operate without maintenance, inspection, or repair, much less replacement, you know, for uh, 40 years. Well, uh, that whole design is now in question thanks to whistleblowers. And uh, we are talking about some very high-level folks. The re manager of research and technology uh, for Bechtel uh, and for URS was terminated, was uh, shown the door from the waste treatment plant. Uh, he's now working uh, out of an office in Richland kind of by himself with, with no duties. And uh, the current manager of environmental and nuclear safety, Donna Bushy, um, 
blew the whistle about a year ago. She is still working there, mostly because they're afraid to fire her. Uh, one of the top scientists and engineers with the Department of Energy is Don Alexander. Uh, he has gone public, and uh, as well as another guy named Gary Brunson, who was the top technical manager for the Department of Energy, and his entire in engineering division is behind him. He's calling for Bechtel's head. He wants to see them terminated from the, from the job as design authority out there. So uh, this, is, this is a plant that um, Hanford does not deliver bad news. It delivers good news. <laughs> and if you want to hear the bad news, but it's news we have to hear, then you have to rely upon either smart activists uh, like you know, Jerry Paulette and uh, Hanford Challenge and uh, Washington PSR to uncover things, Bob Alvarez, uh, or by whistleblowers who tell us what's going on. Uh, and, of course, the Akamal Indian Nation also has its own bevy of scientists and engineers uh, who are also looking at this site. Uh, it's going to be a long challenge. Uh, Hanford is going to be a threat for many, many years to come. Uh, and we know that. We know that we have to work very hard uh, to help safeguard the public interest in this. And Liz is going to talk uh, after Chuck here about some of the strategies that we're using for that. Thanks very much. I'm Chuck Johnson, and I'm the uh, director of a, a new program of Oregon and Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. It's a combined program of the two uh, chapters here in the Northwest. It's a task force on nuclear power and was formed uh, in response to the accident at Fukushima and the fact that we still have one remaining nuclear power plant here in the Pacific Northwest, um, which coincidentally is a GE boiling water reactor. It's a Mark II, but uh, it's quite similar to the, one, the ones that melted down in uh, Japan. Um, it's been, uh, you've been listening to, to Russell and Tom talk about all the various problems at, at Hanford. Um, the Columbia Generating Station, as this nuclear power plant is now called, uh, has been churning away quietly for the last 30 years, um, kind of under the radar because uh, there's so many problems at Hanford that um, are unresolved. There's, it's in so, such complexity that it was felt, I think, for a long time, incorrectly, that this was the least of our worries. Um, but the Japanese accident have, has brought it home that that's certainly not true. Um, if there were an accident at the Columbia Generating Station, if the spent fuel pool there uh, were to rupture and the, the fuel was exposed and it, and, uh, it oxidized or, or burned um, and released into the atmosphere, uh, it would release more radiation than was released at Fukushima just from that one spent fuel pool. And that's true actually of spent fuel pools generally around the country. A little known fact, but something that Bob Alvarez has been trying to talk about for many years and uh, now is getting some people uh, interested in listening. Coincidentally, uh, FYI for those who don't know this, uh, Allison McFarland, the new uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, chair, uh, was a, a, a co-author along with Bob Alvarez and also Frank Van, Von Hippel and a couple of other people in 2002 talking about the, this very danger of the spent fuel pools that we have in the United States at the 103 nuclear power plants that are operating in this country. Um, okay, we've got our, our uh, nuclear reactor here. It's, it's got an interesting history. They tried to build, uh, at one time, they were planning to build 20 nuclear power plants in the Pacific Northwest. They ended up finishing two. Um, one was Trojan, which was uh, privately owned. The other one is the Columbia Generating Station, which uh, was uh, publicly owned by a, a consortium of public utilities in Washington State. The Trojan plant was shut in 1994. Um, the uh, Washington Public Power Supply System, or WHOOPS for short, an interesting acronym, uh, completed only one of the five reactors they were trying to finish. Uh, Whoops is now called Energy Northwest, um, and it consists of 28 utilities uh, in, in Washington State, uh, 
some of which are municipal utilities, others are people's utility districts. One of the municipal utilities that is a co-owner of this nuclear plant is Seattle City Light, which is owned by the citizens of Seattle. Um, little known fact in Seattle currently, unfortunately. That's something we're going to have to change. Um, we're beginning to educate the city council, but we're hoping to uh, get uh, more and more people uh, to recognize this fact and take responsibility for this danger that we, uh, in this city, uh, partly are, are responsible for. Um, so this, this is a fairly daunting task, shutting down a nuclear power plant. If, uh, for those of you in the rest of the country, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of that fact. And, and uh, it, it's something that uh, really something has to go wrong at one of these plants usually before people can, uh, or, or a series of, of very determined uh, campaigns usually are brought forth to, to shut down the plant. Um, the, uh, we now have an additional problem, which is that the small modular reactor, uh, uh, which is a, a, a reactor that's, that's being uh, uh, bid by the uh, U.S. Department of Energy, um, the, uh, 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 oh, God, the uh, uh, boosters at Hanford, the uh, Tridec, thank you. The, uh, the uh, boosters at Hanford have been trying to, uh, they've been talking for several years about being one of the communities that sponsors, uh, that, that gets one of these two reactors. There's been money set aside by Congress to build two experimental reactors. Um, and, uh, uh, but it was not considered to be a serious, a serious threat, but after the, the uh, relicensing of the uh, Columbia Generating Station uh, went through in May. It was announced by Governor Gregoire and uh, supported by Senator Murray uh, that, that uh, they were going to be trying to get one of these two reactors sited at Hanford. Um, the decision on that, I think, is, is it's due, what, within the next, could happen any day now. So we'll know whether or not that's a real, a real threat to uh, this region. Um, even if it's not, one of the companies that is uh, considering, that is that has made a bid to build one of these reactors is located in Corvallis, Oregon. It's an offshoot of Oregon State University. It's the New Scale Company, which uh, was founded, um, oh, I think about a decade ago, spun off from uh, from Oregon State University, and uh, it uh, almost went out of business last year. Um, it was, it's, it, the funding for it was from a, an individual who was then prosecuted by the Securities and Exchange Commission for um, running a Ponzi scheme. And so for six months they had to lay off two-thirds of their workers. Um, unfortunately, the Floor Corporation of Texas came in and, uh, and bailed them out, and now they are actually one of the very seriously considered uh, reactor companies and are getting support from even from liberal Democrats, such as uh, Peter DeFazio, who's somebody you may recognize as being one of the most progressive members of, the, of Congress, uh, has been supporting this new nuclear power plant. The small modular reactor is, this, is basically the concept is, is that you build a platform for a group of reactors, and then um, uh, you can plug and play, as they say. You can, you can build one, add another, add a third, add a fourth, at, at will, as you need them. And it's supposed to add flexibility and reduce the, uh, the cost, the front end cost of building nuclear power plants. Of course, the reason why nuclear power plants have been built big uh, in the past is because of the, um, the economies of scale. You need to build them big. They're expensive to build for them to even you know, be uh, possible to, for them to be economically uh, sound. But the idea with the small modular reactor supposedly is that they will be mass produced. Of course, if you're going to mass produce something, you have to have a, a market to sell it to. And they haven't really figured that out exactly yet, although they have a lot of claims along those lines. And also with mass production, you can have an error and build an awful lot of something and then uh, have a problem that, uh, that is in, incorporated into a, a wide variety of things, of, of reactors. Um, 
So uh, just to summarize, uh, the Columbia Generating Station is uh, a hazard to the region. It's uh, similar to the Fukushima reactors. There are 29 reactors that are boiling water reactors in the United States. Um, and uh, all of them are being required to either, if they're Mark I reactors, uh, improve their venting systems to make sure that they don't have a, a hydrogen explosion as occurred in Japan. The uh, Mark II reactors were not required to put in venting systems at all. So this one that we have uh, in eastern Washington has no vents. If there were a meltdown inside of it, it would explode and, and blast the reactor open. It also has an elevated spent fuel pool like Reactor 4 um, in Japan that was cracked in the earthquake and has to be cooled with a continuous stream of water right now uh, and is in danger of collapse. Um, this, this is the same type of, of spent fuel pool that we have at the uh, Columbia Generating Station. And um, as uh, Tom was saying earlier, earthquake, uh, the knowledge of earthquakes that we have now indicate that these, these facilities were built for uh, a 5.0 earthquake. Um, they know now that, that there's potential for much greater earthquakes out there, and with that elevated spent fuel pool, that's just a loaded, loaded gun um, aimed at the region. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Liz Matson, and I'm with Hand for Challenge. And I am going to talk to you about a uh, project we started called Inheriting Hanford, which hopefully will be helpful for other organizations and folks that have been doing this work their entire lives and would like some company from the younger generations um, who are a little bit harder to get involved um, in this work to clean up weapons of, and stop weapons production um, around the country. So I made this little time scale because I was thinking about, I don't know if you guys have anyone seen Into Eternity, the film that came out uh, not too long ago, but they had a really great uh, graphic of giving you a sense of time. So um, here we are today in Annie's 25th anniversary. Way back a long time ago, we had the pyramids and um, the start when Christ died. Um, and then we, you know, this is just a tiny bit of time from when, you know, the first human remains were carbon dated. And then you scale back here, and then you see the nuclear timeline, where plutonium-239 is, you know, decayed away 240,000 years from now. And then the even farther timeline, which I couldn't fit on here, of um, some radioactive isotopes like technetium-99, which will be dangerous for 2.1 million years. So we have um, a really big problem on our hands when we're trying to clean up nuclear waste. Um, and also a lot of the things that we can't see um, the effects of right away in our lifetime. Some of the effects that might show up uh, 10 generations later. Um, and that's one thing that we deal with a lot at Hanford um, is the issue of not being able to see it so it's not a problem. Um, and a lot of denial around the health effects um, for people that are really invested in um, the nuclear industry. Um, so the reason that we need more people involved is that, um, so my friend Tom here in 1979, <laughs> and then my friend Tom here in 2012. He looks a little different, huh? So I wasn't born in 1979, but I was born in 1980. So you can, you can see we need constantly to bring new generations into this work. Um, and that you can spend your entire life doing this work, as some of you have experienced. Um, so I just wanted to, to capture that. And, so, and this is going to be the same for me. When I get to be older, there will be hopefully some young person that I can put their baby picture next to me. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is um, through, on a lot of, we go to a lot of meetings, and I attend a lot of meetings, um, through the Hanford Advisory Board, which is a board of interests that captures um, citizen and um, government groups, local government, and um, all sorts of interests. The tribes are a part of the board, and all the nuclear weapons complex sites have boards 
that are similar to this. Our board is a little bit different because we are founded on interest. So Hanford Challenge has a seat. Um, the Richland Rod and Gun Club has a seat. The Yakima Nation has a seat. Um, uh, Rich, the city of Richland has a seat. So there's a lot of really diverse interests on the board. And a lot of people are older on the board. So you can see this is just, you know, the typical board meeting. And then usually I'm there. And there aren't that many other young people there. Um, and so we want to get more people involved. And the kind of involvement you need for these issues is deep involvement. You can't, surface involvement for these really complex situations just doesn't work. Um, as I'm sure you've experienced if you've tried to explain some of the issues from your site that you work on or an issue that you care about to someone, it takes a while to get someone interested in understanding the issue. And especially with Hanford, um, I usually tell people it takes about two years to get up to speed enough to really be able to understand what people are talking about. And then about four years in, you can start participating meaningfully. And I'm at five years now, and it's like, yes, I finally can really make things happen. Um, but that's a, bit, a big time commitment for most people in my generation to think about it takes five years so you can actually feel like you're making a difference. Um, a lot of people want to feel like they're making a difference right away and that they understand things. Um, and to make this deep involvement happen, um, we need more young people to be getting involved continuously. So, so part of this project for us is um, recruiting people to get involved and then supporting them through mentorship, which I'm going to talk about, and then sustaining that involvement over the long term because we're going to need to, as we saw in my timeline, it's going to take a long time to deal with some of this waste, and especially at Hanford where we have at least 40 more years, and a lot of people would say 100 more years or more before we're really done with cleanup. And are we really ever going to be done given all the waste that was dumped into the ground there and is they're planning to leave? So we have some, um, some things that we've been able to do. Um, is we have been hosting a forum for shared conversation about challenging issues at Hanford, a very long title, um, once a year in the spring to try to get um, a conversation going that's outside of the more tip, the formal spaces that where we have to wear our official positions and have um, barriers between really listening and understanding each other. Um, because if you are representing your agency, it's really hard to say what you really think, even if you've been doing the work for 25 years and you actually agree with a lot of people that um, it seems like you might not agree with. So that's one place where we've been trying to bring more young people in to learn from the incredible resources that exist um, with experience and um, people have been doing this work for a long time. So. The big question is, where do we find all these young people? Um, and how do we get them to take on these issues? And we've done a few things that um, have been working for us. Um, since we started this project, we've gotten more young people involved. And when we talk about um, numbers, the metrics for success here, we use more small scale. So if we get 10 young people involved in a year, that's amazing success. If you really get two people to stick with the issue, it's amazing it's that you're, you've succeeded. And that's different than a lot of other things where you need 50 people to really feel successful. So, um, and then a lot of things that, you know, we're, cleanup is kind of, we've had the, the metaphor of cleanup is a marathon or cleanup is a relay and we're trying to get to the finish line and what's gonna take to get us to the finish line. And a lot of that for me is getting that information transferred to the next generation and then just having systems in place where that happens naturally so we get that information moved along like a, a relay race. So um, that's what we're trying to do. And then the big question is how do we prepare people to be effective and meaningful participants and leaders, which is what we need the young people to take on. So the first thing that we found is getting people to understand the information, the rules, and the lingo and the culture because it's not easy. Let me tell you, the first few meetings you go to, you want to like go cry in the bathroom because you can't understand what people are saying. You ask a question and people look at you funny. It's not easy. Um, so some of the things that you know we've done is, is asking questions and trying to set up a mentorship program through Inheriting Hanford is creating opportunities for, for that transfer of knowledge to happen. 
So some of that is you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, working in groups. And then the big thing for me is making um, all of these things fun. Because no one wants to come to a boring meeting. You're not going to attract people to you know, come join your effort if you don't make it fun and try some creative techniques. So um, some things we've done um, is create an event that will draw people on its own. And then you just tack on the nuclear issue next to it. So free ice cream in the park. Who doesn't want to come have free ice cream in the park? And then to get that free ice cream, they have to learn about Hanford and take a survey and weigh in on what their most important cleanup issue is. And then they get their ice cream and they've learned about the issue. Um, and that's worked really effectively for us. Um, we've also experimented with having plays using skits and theater to try to um, communicate about issues. So this is, a, is still from a, a fabulous production of the Slaying the Tank Waste Dragon production uh, that we put on with the, uh, the wizard that was imparting to the young mentor how to um, use an environmental impact statement to, uh, make, uh, to get the public involved and make a difference. And you can play games and also use uh, visuals like the, um, look at me, I'm a, uh, a single shell tank that is leaking. <laughs> Yeah. This one has been very popular at uh, public meetings. Um, and then a big thing is just supporting the efforts of young people as they're trying to change the system. Because um, that's really, it, having that encouragement really makes a difference. Um, and I've, I've benefited a lot from a lot of the encouragement I've had on the Hanford Advisory Board. Um, and even, I would have never thought I would be a chair of a committee, but a lot of people were like, Liz, you're going to be the chair. That's it. And you say, okay, how do I do that? And then you get help to make it happen. We also created a website um, to have people be able to meet each other. So you can check that out at inheritinghanford.com. So people can post um, a little blurb about who they are and what kind of interest they have in Hanford. And then if someone's interested, they can go check them out and then pair up with them or meet them if they're in their region. Um, and it is organized by region. So um, you can find people that live near you. Um, so the, the moral of the story is that I think we can build a new generation of young leaders to improve and influence the decisions and environmental policy far into the future. We just have to work together and never give up trying to recruit new people. And I know it's not easy, but I think it's possible. So here we are, charging into the future with our, um, our young people. So. Thank you.